Hey everyone, welcome to another movie review. This one will be about the intense and existentially provocative 2011 movie, The Grey, starring Liam Neeson as John Otway. This movie is one of my favorites, because it's a naked and ruthless exploration of human struggle, and there's just as much conflict and compassion between the human characters as there is between the humans and the physical environment they find themselves in. It is a dark and yet desperately optimistic film. It combines the empty mercenary suffering of modern man, his fear of his inevitable death, and the psychological pain inherent to the human condition to tremendous effect, creating a film that's simultaneously a sad and depressing story and a stoic exultation of human willpower and resistance in the face of inevitability. I really love this movie, so let's get started. The plot begins in the remote northern wilderness of Alaska, at the facilities of an unnamed oil drilling company. There are several scenes displaying the industrial architecture, the pipes, the valves, the warehouses, all blanketed with heavy snowfall and a black sky. The only light comes from the pale, artificial glow of the lights surrounding the facilities. And right away, you feel cold, almost hopeless and alone, you feel very separated from the rest of civilization. As is mentioned in Otway's inner monologue, he's at the edge of the world. John Otway is a security guard who shoots wolves that might attack the oil drillers. It's his last day on the job, and after shooting a wolf, he approaches it and feels its dying breath. He has a moment with this mortally wounded animal, and later that night, he writes a letter to his wife where he says, He's going to commit suicide. He goes outside, puts his rifle in his mouth, and is about to pull the trigger when he hears a wolf howl, and ultimately he decides not to shoot himself. The next day, he's leaving the facility, as the day before was his last, uh, his last on shift. Some other guys are leaving with him too, some other guys that are also on his shift, and they all get on a plane. In the air, they experience turbulence, and everyone gets pretty uncomfortable. It gets a bit better, but then it gets much worse. The turbulence is so bad that the plane starts to fall apart. The most terrifying scene is Otway buckling himself in to three seats, as the roof of the plane rips off above him, revealing a snowy forested hillside. The plane is upside down falling apart, and ultimately ends up crashing somewhere in the Alaskan wilderness. A small handful of people, including Otway, survive the crash. Almost immediately, an injured man bleeds to death. He asks for help, but Otway recognizes that it's too late, and tells the man he's going to die. He comforts him, and asks him to think of the people he loves, and to feel the warmth of death creep over him. The man dies. Otway seems to be the only person with their heads screwed on right, so he leads the group of survivors to make preparations to survive. You know, everyone else is too freaked out or too confused uh, to know what to do. They soon learn that they're in wolf territory, when a wolf attacks Otway, only to be fought off and discouraged by some of the others. Shortly afterward, a small group of wolves attack again, and they rip another survivor apart, leaving his mangled body in the snow, his spilled blood filling up their paw prints. Otway begins collecting the wallets of those who've died, so that their identities will be known, in case Otway and some others survive the ordeal. They try to flee the ruins of the plane crash, but another man is killed as he falls behind and gets attacked by a handful of wolves. They kill him, but they don't eat him. They're antagonizing the humans, terrifying them, playing with them. Having escaped to a forested area, the survivors build weapons with sticks and shotgun shells and set up a campfire to keep the wolves away. One of the survivors, Diaz, played by Frank Grillo, is becoming an antagonist, challenging Otway and calling out what he perceives as his mistakes. Throughout the movie, this character will develop and open up, and you learn that he is an emotionally wounded man. His life is sad and empty. He feels like he doesn't have control over his life, and he reacts emotionally to insults and challenges. 
when they're at a campfire, Diaz is freaking out and almost attacks Otway, but he's ambushed by a weaker member of the wolf pack, and although he kills it, he is clearly disturbed and freaked out. He stabs the animal dozens of times long after it's dead, and kicks at its corpse out of a, a kind of primal fear. To recover from this, he decapitates the dead wolf and throws its head back into the darkness of the woods, where the other wolves make unsettling howls of sadness and fury. The wolves are cut short when the alpha wolf snarls and howls, followed by the rest of the wolf pack. Even in the darkness of the forest, it's obvious that they're surrounded by many dozens of wolves. In the cold darkness after this encounter, the survivors talk amongst themselves. They tell stories about their lives, they talk about their regrets, and despite the circumstances, they find themselves laughing. It's a sad but very human scene. Diaz states that he has no belief in God, while another character, Talgit, played by Dermot Mulroney, states his belief in God and mentions his daughter. Otway shares Diaz's inclination, but wishes that he could believe. Otway is the kind of atheist who wishes for there to be a higher power, uh, some kind of order or plan, some kind of mercy in the world, but he can't make himself believe in light of the things he's seen, the things he knows, and the life he's lived. He recites to the group a poem that his father wrote, which is a recurring motif throughout the movie. The poem is a short encapsulation of a struggle, often a futile, hopeless struggle, that one fights anyway. The poem goes as follows, quote, Once more into the fray, to the last good fight I'll ever know, live and die on this day, live and die on this day, Unquote. A blizzard approaches them that night, and they seek shelter, but awake to find that a character named Burke, played by Nonso and Ozzy, has frozen to death. There is a long scene with Otway desperately and pointlessly pounding on Burke's chest, yelling at him to wake up, but his face is frosted over. His body is still. Once more, the survivors try to keep moving, trying to get out of the wolves' territory, and now they come to the edge of a steep cliff face, with a river flowing at the bottom. While trying to get across to safer ground, Talget gets his foot caught. His glasses fall off and he ends up falling into the ravine, crashing into a tree and tumbling down through the branches to the ground, where he coughs up blood. As he lays dying on the floor of the valley, he sees his little daughter standing over him. He whispers to her and feels her hair on his face. She says she loves him, and then the wolves drag him away and kill him. Diaz is up in a tree, and he, he looks down and sees Talget being attacked, and he tries to come down to save him, but he falls from the tree and injures himself. His knee is dislocated or fractured or something, and soon he realizes that he can barely walk. As the group recovers and then walks on, they pass by a tree stump that had been logged and marked by loggers, so they know that other people have been here at least some time in recent years. They try to walk along the river, trying to make it to some shelter or some form of human settlement, but Diaz is too injured and he cannot go on any longer. He resigns himself, explaining that his life is empty and pointless, that he has nothing to go back to. He asks Otway what death is like, if it's true that it's warm, like how he told that first man who died right after the plane crashed. This ordeal has been the capstone to Diaz's life, and he says that when he looks at the wilderness around him, at the pristine beauty of the natural world, he says that he feels like it was made all for him. Another character, Hendrix, clings to hope like he clings to his belief in God, and he urges Diaz to keep going, but he can't convince him. He tries to point out that a cabin might be right around the river bend, that they've already been through so much, but his pleas amount to nothing. He is disturbed and upset by Diaz's choice to die, but ultimately he cannot change his mind. Diaz asks Hendrix when his life will be better than it is right now. He's surrounded by the wilderness, the wilderness that killed him and that will swallow him up after he dies, and he thinks that it's the most beautiful thing in the world. 
He says there's no point going back to sit on a drill all day, drinking beer and fucking prostitutes. There's no love in his life, no purpose, no connection. But he feels that love and that purpose and that connection here on his deathbed, on a log by a river in the remote Alaskan wilderness. In a really touching moment that ends the scene, they tell each other their first names, overcoming the social formalities that kept them emotionally distant in life. Now, in death, they are naked and exposed to the elements together. There's no more hiding. They share their names, and they turn to leave Diaz to his fate. There's a long scene of Diaz crying softly as he dies there by the river, under the watchful gaze of the mountains and the forest. Hendrix and Otway continue down the river, and as they walk, Hendrix mentions that he saw Otway that night at the bar. He saw Otway go out with his rifle, and essentially asks him if he was going to kill himself. Otway asks if he followed him. Hendrix says no, but he thought he wasn't going to see him again. The look that Diaz had on his face when he decided that he wanted to stay there and die, Hendrix says that he saw that same face, that same expression, on Otway that night at the camp when he went to kill himself. They agree that it doesn't matter anymore, and they keep moving. But then, they get attacked by wolves. They try to run, but they get forced into the river. Hendrix falls in and gets swept along the current, and Otway tries to save him. But Hendrix's boot gets caught on some submerged rocks, and he drowns. He drowns as Otway holds his hands, trying to pull him out, while pleading with a god that he doesn't believe in to show him a miracle. Hendrix dies with his face just a few inches below the surface of the water. Otway is now all alone. He stumbles out of the river and collapses, screaming in fury at God. He condemns faith and demands something real, telling God to prove himself. The once unbreakable man who others looked to for guidance and who tried to keep the others alive is now broken, and as he rages against his fate, he realizes that he is all alone. There is no God. And he says, Fuck it, I'll do it myself. Otway is able to make it a bit further through the woods, but soon he realizes that he's doomed. Otway pulls out the wallets and looks at the faces of all the people who've died since the plane crash. In his own wallet is a picture of his wife, who was dying of a terminal illness. This is revealed to be the cause of his depression and suffering, and the locus of his suicide attempt. It is at this point, as he realizes that he's doomed, that he notices all of the antlers and elk bones, and comes to understand that he is in the wolves' den. They've been going deeper into wolf territory this whole time, not out of it. The alpha wolf emerges from the trees to stand above him, its fur black, its body impossibly large. The alpha wolf comes closer to him, and Otney tapes a knife and some shattered liquor bottles to his hands. He recites his father's poem one more time, and then he launches himself at the Alpha, surging once more into the fray, into the last good fight he'll ever know. The scene cuts to black right as they engage in this classic battle of man versus nature, of man versus beast. But after the credits, once the credits are all rolled by, there is one final scene, a single cut, that shows the Alpha Wolf taking its final breaths much like the first wolf that was shot by Otway at the very beginning of the film. And now, you see Otway leaning against the wolf, but his fate is uncertain. The symbolism of the wolf breathing is that the wolf is dead, or the wolf is dying, but you see his head resting against the wolf in a way very similar to how you saw Diaz's head when Diaz was leaning against the log waiting to die. So, his fate is uncertain. The film ends with the viewer unsure if Otway actually lived or died on that day. Damn, man, I love this movie. I think it is so good. It's so bleak and ruthless and unforgiving. It's so raw and human. The dialogue is great. I mean, it's not perfect. There's some lines that are delivered a little stiffly, but it's really good. I don't think there's a single line that feels, you know, too forced or out of place. 
And as far as the setting goes, I have personally worked in facilities much like this in northern Alaska, with a bunch of depressed, alcoholic men, and I think the film does a really good job capturing this gray emptiness, the materialistic hopelessness, the emotional and physical darkness, and the disorientation of being so disconnected from the rest of human civilization. All right, so let's rate the gray. From a plot perspective, I can't really find any major faults with the movie. Perhaps the characters weren't as affected by the cold as they would be in real life. And perhaps the wolves in the movie were a little more calculating and antagonistic than they are in real life. But ultimately, these are small nitpicks. So, for its plot, I'm going to give The Grey a 9 out of 10. The film's depiction of biology is similarly high quality. The characters are very vulnerable to the elements, as they get killed by wolves, gravity, water, and the cold itself. They get realistically injured, and they realistically suffer for it. They don't have superpowers, and they don't heal magically fast. It's brutal and real. The only nitpick I have here is that if it really was that cold, they would probably succumb to hypothermia a little, a little quicker, but, you know, again, a little nitpick. Really, there's only three complaints that I have about this aspect of the movie, but none of them are huge and unforgivable mistakes. They're just minor complaints. First, plane crashes are usually extreme. Either the pilot is able to save the plane and most or everyone on board survives, or the pilot can't save the plane and everyone on board dies. Maybe there's one or two survivors. Maybe but everyone's body is mangled. Realistically, they all should have died in the ruins of the plane, all of them being too injured to leave to go anywhere. They would have been at the mercy of the wolves, unable to unbuckle themselves from their seats. But if this happened, this really wouldn't make for much of a movie, would it? So I guess in that sense, it's, it's forgivable. Second, and honestly, I'm, I'm not even sure how accurate my criticism is, but it seemed like the wolves were too... cerebral. They taunted the humans, picking them off one by one, leaving them to die, you know, leaving them for others to find, or attacking them in ways where the humans would see their friend being killed, but would be helpless to save them. Now, while this adds to the intensity of the movie, I'm not really sure how plausible or realistic this is. I'm inclined to think that in real life, the wolves wouldn't play these mind games. But honestly, I don't know. My thinking is that wolves would just uh, hunt down and kill one or two of them, and then drag them back to their den or drag them somewhere they can eat them, and then they would eat them. But then their bellies would be full for a while, so they would leave the humans alone, because humans are dangerous. And even though wolves will hunt and kill you know, lone humans on occasion, it has happened, I feel reasonably confident in saying that most animals would be, you know, really discouraged from a group of humans with weapons attacking them and sometimes killing them every time they came into proximity. Maybe wolves are just more sinister bastards than I give them credit for. You know, I don't know. And my third complaint is that the alpha wolf was huge. Like, unrealistically huge. Real-life alpha wolves are big, uh, I should say more dominant wolves, because the whole alpha, beta, omega dynamic that this movie frequently mentioned, it actually doesn't really exist in real-life wolf populations. Wolves exist and live and interact more like a family. There's situational context, where one individual may be dominant in that situation than another. Unsurprisingly, it's all very nuanced. But the movie, uh, the movie kind of relies on this alpha wolf, beta wolf, omega wolf dynamic. And so this alpha wolf that it's portraying is Hollywood monster big. You know, it's, it's a giant forest beast, some leviathan from a bygone era, uh, except lost somewhere in the Alaska wilderness, unknown to modern science. You know, I don't know. Shit, for all we know, there actually is some giant wolf out in the wilderness somewhere, like some surviving dire wolf or something. I mean, maybe, but probably not, though. So, with all of this said, I'm going to give The Grey a 7 out of 10 for its portrayal of biology. It would have gotten a perfect score, but I chipped off one point for each of my complaints. 
leaving the gray with uh, what is still quite a good score, especially when compared to some of the other movies that I've reviewed. All right, so that's about it. The Gray is a crazy, brutal movie, but it's awesome. I love it. If you haven't seen it, go see it. But just remember, it's not a happy movie.